In this video, we'll look at aorist passive infinitive and imperative verbs. Before we look at the aorist passive infinitives, let's take a moment to review what we've learned about aorist infinitive forms. We've already learned uh, that aorist infinitives have no augment. So in each of these forms, at the beginning, we won't find an epsilon augment. Uh, here we find an epsilon in elthane and elthesthi, but remember that's because that epsilon is part of the elth stem, and this is the aorist form of Urkami, remember. And uh, in the indicative mood, uh, we add an augment, another epsilon, on the beginning, which lengthens that epsilon to an eta. So that's why we have elth here instead of elth because we've removed that augment and the epsilon has shortened back down to, to uh, its normal epsilon form. The first aorist infinitive forms are dominated by this sa uh, combination of sigma, which is the first aorist tense marker, and the alpha connecting vowel. Um, so we have in the first aorist active infinitive, lusai, and in the middle infinitive, lusasthai. With the second aorist, we find the, again, the second aorist stem, along with the typical epsilon connecting vowel and the present infinitive endings. And why can we use the present infinitive endings? Because we know from the uh, stem change here that we're dealing with uh, an aorist form without having to use any special endings. So for the second aorist we had elthane and in the middle elthesthai. Now when we add to this chart the aorist passive infinitive uh, there isn't really too much that's surprising. We have the aorist passive stem, uh, which in the first aorist is just lu, uh, but in the second aorist we had stem change, and for the verb apostello, uh, in the aorist passive that changed to apostal, and we had the aorist passive form uh, apostalane. So we keep that apostal, but remember we remove the uh, epsilon augment. So instead of apestalane, we now have apostal as the stem. And then following that stem in both the first aorist and second aorist, passive infinitive, we add on the same things that we added on for the uh, passive inf uh, aorist passive indicative verbs. So onto the lu of the first aorist, we have the theta tense marker and the eta connecting vowel. In the second aorist, remember we didn't have to add the theta uh, and we just used the eta connecting vowel. So the, the first aorist form um, looks really just like, uh, uh, very much like eleuthane, the first person singular aorist passive indicative, but we have the same I, uh, alpha iota ending there that we had at the end of lusai and lusasthai. Now we have luthani. Similarly, in the second aorist, we have apostalani, the same uh, ani ending. What is the meaning of the aorist passive infinitive? Well, really it's identical to the other aorist infinitives. The only difference is that we now are using a passive voice and we've already talked about what the passive voice means. Uh, it means that the subject of the sentence is the one receiving the action or undergoing the action rather than being the one performing the action. Remember that the aorist is the default tense outside the indicative mood. Um, that means that these verbs have uh, a perfective aspect, but if you remember that perfective aspect means there's no particular emphasis. 
No particular time is implied here, and it's important that we remember we're outside the indicative mood, and so there's no time implied at all from the fact that it's an aorist verb. This is not a past uh, time infinitive. This is simply uh, a passive infinitive with perfective aspect, looking at the action as a simple whole. For example, luthani we might gloss as to be set free or being set free. Apostalani we could gloss as to be sent or being sent. And graphani we could gloss as to be written or being written. Let's shift now to the first aorist imperative. And uh, as with the infinitives, let's just review briefly the active and middle forms for the aorist imperative. So in the aorist active imperative, uh, we had uh, luson, and you can see uh, in the first aorist forms here, this sigma tense marker, which runs all throughout both the active and middle imperative forms. And uh, we have in most of these forms, the alpha connecting vowel following that sigma tense marker. But as usual, the second person singular, uh, when I want to say you as an individual uh, do something, um, that tends to be irregular. And so here, instead of Lusanne, uh, we have an Omicron, Lusanne. You just got to kind of remember that. But our active imperative forms then were Lusanne for the second person singular, Lusato for the third person singular, Lusata for the second person plural, and Lusatosan for the third person plural. And we've already looked at those in the past. This is just review. For the middle imperative, remember we had lusai, and then lusastho, lusastha for the second person plural, and lusasthosan. And you can see again the relationship between the active uh, imperative forms and the middle imperative forms. The second person singular tends to be irregular. Uh, but here the ato just becomes astho, and the ate of the second person plural becomes astha. And that is the typical pattern moving from the aorist active imperative to the aorist middle imperative is that the, the tau becomes sigma theta. And if you can remember that, that the tau becomes sigma theta, then you should be able to remember the middle imperative forms uh, quite easily. Now, if we add on the passive infer imperative forms, we find that in these first aorist imperatives, uh, we have that same combination of theta tense marker and eta connecting vowel that we saw again with the aorist passive indicative verbs. The second person singular ending that we add on to that the is again irregular. So we have luthate or luthate we might pronounce it. But after that we find that the forms become quite regular. So the third person singular adds the same toe ending that we saw in the uh, active imperative. Uh, the second person plural adds the same te that we saw in the active imperative, and the same tosan that we saw in the third person plural. So luthate, luthato, luthate, and luthatosan. This means that really, as we look at all of the aorist uh, imperative forms, um, if we can remember the, sing, uh, the, the aorist uh, active imperatives, and if we can remember the second person singular forms, uh, then we can fairly easily come up with the other forms. If we just remember that uh, in the middle, the tau becomes sigma theta. And if we remember that uh, in the aorist passive, uh, 
we revert to uh, the same endings as in the active. Moving to the second aorist imperative forms, we find a familiar pattern again. There's no augment here on any of these imperatives. Remember, the augment is only for indicative mood verbs. And we have the second aorist stem being used with the present imperative endings. And the epsilon connecting vowel uh, follows uh, through all of these forms, except the second person singular uh, in the middle, which tends to be irregular. We have then labe, labeto, labete, labetosan, uh, with the same to, te, tosan endings that we saw throughout the uh, uh, present and uh, first aorist imperative forms. In the middle imperative, once again, these taus become sigma thetas, and we have genu, the irregular form, but then genestho, genestha, and genesthosan. And this, of course, is uh, gen, the uh, aorist, uh, second aorist stem of ginamai. So ginamai, uh, if you remember, becomes in the second aorist egenomain and we're using that same gen stem, just without the augment and without the amen ending. If we add now the second aorist passive imperative forms, we find exactly the same pattern that we saw before. The second aorist passive forms use the same endings that we saw in the first aorist passive. Um, the T that was an irregular ending in the second person singular is the same here in the second aorist passive. And uh, the one difference from the first aorist passive is that the theta is absent now throughout. We still use the second aorist uh, passive stem, the same stem that we used in the second aorist passive indicative verbs. Uh, we take off the augment and uh, we keep the eta connecting vowel. And so we have graffete, grafeto, third person singular, grafeta, second person plural, and grafetosan. And once again, you can see how uh, the endings here so much resemble the uh, aorist, second aorist active imperative endings. And uh, the only difference in the middle is that that tau has become sigma theta. What is the meaning of the aorist passive imperative? Well, as we saw with aorist passive infinitives, um, not much has changed just because we've gone to the passive voice. So aorist passive imperatives are identical to other aorist imperative verbs, just using the passive voice. And again, the aorist tense doesn't mean anything here about past time because we're outside the indicative mood. And this is the default way of giving uh, instructions or giving commands to use the aorist tense. Some examples, Lutheti, we would translate be set free. Apostaleto, we might translate let him be sent or he must be sent. Grafeta, we could translate be written. Uh, and this is a second person plural, so maybe we're uh, uh, giving instructions to uh, our uh, sets of essays and saying to all of our essays, be written. A uh, bit of wishful thinking. Or we have lechthetosan, which we might translate let them be said, or they must be said. You can learn more about aorist passive infinitives and aorist passive imperatives in Mounts' Basics of Biblical Greek, and uh, you see the page numbers for each section there.